Good morning and welcome to a partly uncomfortable Bible reading today. It's uncomfortable, isn't it, to listen to people publicly accusing one another of wrongdoing or all sorts of problems. They may be housemates and you're overhearing the discussion or family members, uh, maybe not even your own family, you're overhearing someone else's argument out in public. Maybe there are people in a workplace disagreeing with one another. And when you hear that kind of thing, I don't know about you, but I quite often want to be elsewhere. You know the idea? You just feel a little uncomfortable there. Well, that feeling covers much of Genesis chapter 31, our passage for today. There's a polite veneer to what happens, but really there's plenty of heat and disagreement in the accusations between Jacob and Laban. So if I was going to describe the trajectory of Genesis 31, that uh, unveils and reveals all this uh, accusation, the, the, the shape of the whole chapter is like this. There is pressure, pressure, more pressure, and sudden relief. It's uncomfortable with the pressure building, with the accusations being levelled, and the relief is all the more surprising for that pressure having built. We can see that uh, idea of pressure, 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 relief in the whole picture of the chapter and also in a small picture within the chapter that kind of illustrates the bigger theme that's going on. So we're going to have a, a look briefly at the whole picture and also at the small picture just to see if we've captured what uh, Genesis 31 is about. Start with the whole picture first. The uh, reading that we had today from verse 17 begins with an escape by Jacob and his family. They flee from where they are in Mesopotamia. From verse 17, So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away all his livestock, all his property that he had gained in livestock, in his possession that he had acquired in Padan Aram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. And Jacob tricked Laban the Aramean by not telling him what he, that he intended to flee. He fled with all that he had, and arose and crossed the Euphrates, and set his face towards the hill country of Gilead. Here's Jacob uh, with four women who are mothers to his children. A lumbering caravan of all their possessions, he'd acquired many things, in the years he'd spent in this part of the world. And he got a head start from his father-in-law, Laban, by escaping when shearing was going on. A very busy task that calls all hands to be at work. And he disappears without notice. Suddenly he's gone. Disappeared from the environment. But after this escape, there's a chase. Laban took his kinsmen it's got the feeling of being chased by a, a posse. Is Laban after revenge here, perhaps? And the escape and the chase eventually lead to a catch as Laban, perhaps empowered by anger and rage, goes quicker than Jacob, who's certainly slowed down by the family and all the possessions. Verse 25, And Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinsmen pitched tents in the hill country of Gilead. So here we have a fugitive and chaser camping together, at least inside of one another. And as you might expect, a confrontation follows where the accusations flow. And these accusations increase the pressure that's uh, obviously building through the chapter. There's a long speech from Laban, and uh, Jacob gets to say a fair bit as well along the way. Um, hear Laban's anger as he speaks. Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? He's saying it's like a war's happened, and you're the conquering army who's come in and taken my daughters away. Or well, verse 27, why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre? 
And why did you not permit me to, permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? Now you've done foolishly. Now, it's not really like the Laban we've met over the last few chapters to spend money on a party, is it? Uh, even when he got Rachel and Leah married off, he got them married in the same wedding week. Two daughters married for only one marriage party. He, I think he's rambling and ranting here. He's making stuff up. So the sort of thing that people do when they get angry. And the last phrase there of verse 28, that really implies a threat, doesn't it? You have done foolishly. Whatever is about to happen, it sounds like, is your fault. You have brought this upon yourself. You are the guilty, foolish one. And then we read, it is in my power to do you harm. Here's Laban and a bunch of wild men in the wilderness, boasting of the power to hurt. That's not an implicit threat anymore, is it? That's an explicit threat to do damage to Jacob, to the women with him, to the young sons and daughters they have, and all the possessions as well. And Jacob, reasonably enough, explains that he feared his father-in-law. You'd see why. He's just been threatened by him. Later on, Jacob moves from explaining his fear to a strong and angry defence. More anger going on here. Uh, verse 36. Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, What is my offence? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Have we met cranky Jacob before? He's been tricky, subtle, cunning. I don't know if we've met cranky Jacob before, but in any case... Once he starts speaking here, the complaints pour out. Verse 38. These twenty years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. Twenty years of work, and I haven't done anything wrong. Now you're making a threat to me? Or verse 40. There I was by day, the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. It's been hard work for Jacob. He's been committed to the flock, to the work. Verse 41. Um, These 20 years I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. Maybe that's the first time he said that to Laban's face, even though we heard that accusation spoken to his wives in last week's reading. And into this explosive scene where the tension has been building, what we read is, verse 44, uh, from Laban speaking, Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. What? <laughs> What's going on here? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. And so they do make a covenant, and they raise memorial stones and a pillar of stones. What is this covenant? It's an agreement. It's, it includes formal promises. It's a two-sided relationship. Um, there are plenty of covenants in evidence from the ancient world, from the, the time that we're speaking about here. And here's a, here's a covenant between people who seem to be dealing as equals. Laban, Jacob. Laban and his family and descendants, Jacob and his family and descendants. The covenant in this case is an ongoing one. It seems to um, be applied also to the descendants of these families. There's a series of steps building up through Genesis chapter 31. And the last step seems different. It seems out of place, or at least needing some sort of explanation. The steps are these. There's escape. There's a chase. There's a catch and confrontation, and then there's an agreement, and they both go their own ways. That last step, the, the ending, seems a bit perplexing. Head-scratcher, isn't it? Inside the chapter, there's a smaller picture, and it's got that same arc, the same direction of the story unfolding. There's a smaller picture, but it's very similar to the 
bigger picture. This is the story of the stolen gods. It also builds. It also builds pressure. It also ends with a resolution that has no bad outcome. So we see in verse 19, Laban had gone to shear his sheep and Rachel stole her father's household gods. There's the start of it. Verse 30. This is Laban speaking. He says, Now you have gone away because you long greatly for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? That's probably the most reasonable question that Laban asked, the most reasonable comment he makes in this uh, rant and discussion. Why did you steal those gods? But what happens in verse 32? Anyone, this is Jacob speaking now, anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. And the presence of our kinsmen pointed out what I have done. Point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. He's just promised the threat to enter life to whoever holds the gods. And it's his favourite wife that we know as readers took those gods. Verse 33, so... Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but he did not find them. Of course not. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. The tension's building. Laban, he went everywhere the gods weren't. We know that. He's now gone into the tent where we expect them to be found. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household gods. Rachel could have died. And he did not find them, is the outcome. In the end, we laugh at Laban, because he's in a forensic search for evidence of Jacob's evil. And we know, as readers, he's getting closer to where those gods will be found. But Laban, in this forensic search for guilt, he gets scared off by the thought of Rachel's monthly period. He doesn't complete his search. Jacob is safe. So there's a small picture, this little incident with the God. And there's the big picture of the flight and the chase and the catching and the accusations. And in both those pictures, the small picture and the big one, Jacob was under increasing threat of loss. The tension builds in both of those stories. And there's a sudden twist and we all sort of breathe out in relief. Jacob is saved. Jacob is safe. His possessions, his family, his household, his future seemed secured. Was Jacob saved by his own cleverness? No, certainly not. It wasn't Jacob. The safety for Jacob was definitely not won by Jacob's own hand. Think of the matter of the stolen gods, firstly. The security and the safety were not from Jacob in any way. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Jacob did not know that the gods were in his camp. Jacob did not know that his favourite wife, Rachel, was in danger because of his own oath. And Jacob did not know, at first at least, that Rachel had saved him by tricking Laban. Jacob knew nothing. And Jacob was safe. He didn't win his own safety at all there, did he? Well, think about the, the whole picture the story of all of chapter 31. In the whole picture of this long chapter, Laban is the angry father or father-in-law who seems set on revenge. He mentions the harm, the, the evil he could do to Jacob and to the whole household. But the whole of verse 29 counts, not just the first bit that I read before with the threat, the whole of verse 29 it is in my power to do you harm, says Laban. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Look at the timing. It's just last 
night. The dream got mentioned in verse 24 as well, if you want to see uh, the first account of it there. But God spoke to Laban just before he was going to see Jacob. God had a quiet word in the ear of Laban. He says, hey Laban, don't think of throwing your weight around tomorrow, will you? Don't do anything. Don't say anything. We get a sense of how angry Laban was through those words. And remember these words of Laban, they poured out from him after God said, say nothing. Imagine if Laban really let fly. <laughs> Imagine how angry, how violent possibly he would have been in his language. Laban, he, he doesn't, he doesn't end up here being allied with the Lord God of the Bible. Laban stays as a, um, a polytheist, a believer in different gods, it seems. Laban, you could say, has his own gods, except, of course, that someone's stolen those gods, so he, he doesn't even have his own gods there. He would have his own gods. He maybe has to buy some more, but he certainly doesn't have the God of the Bible. But despite this, Laban bows before the Lord God. He accepts that the Lord has power over him, over the whole situation. Laban is resigned to the divine power here. You can hear his resignation in verse 43 where he's speaking there. Laban answered, he still starts off angry, but he he's resigned to his powerlessness before God. He says, the daughters are my daughters, and the children are my children. The flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day for these my daughters or for their children whom they have born? What power do I have? What future do I have in fighting against God? Can I fight against the Lord? Really, it's not in his power, not in his hand to do wrong. And all he can do is offer to make an agreement. The covenant is probably... Laban answering that question, what can I do for my daughters? Make an agreement with you, because you are the one, Jacob. You, Jacob, are the one God is blessing. And this is the point in the whole story between Jacob and Laban. This is the point where Laban stops trying to use Jacob, I think. Because Jacob's God is too great for him. The safe call is for Laban to make peace with Jacob. Peace today and peace into the future. A covenant, a solemn promise with all the elements of that covenant. Laban says, you are saved by God's intervention. Despite my anger and the power in my hand, you are saved by God's intervention. And Jacob says, actually, yes, you're right. <laughs> I was saved by the Lord, by his intervention. Verse 42, if the God of my father the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac, had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labour of my hands and rebuked you last night. That's a pretty blunt thing to say to your father-in-law, who's threatened you, who's chased you for days. You would have sent me away with nothing, wouldn't you? You would have sent me away empty-handed, wouldn't you? You cheated me, and you would cheat me again, except that God was with me. God's rebuked you. Genesis 31 is the highest peak of drama between Jacob and Laban. This is where it gets most serious, most threatening, most dangerous. And both men admit the same thing, that the results are the work of the Lord God. Laban was greedy, cunning, but his greed and cunning failed to sway affairs. Jacob himself, he was tricky and self-serving. That's why he had to run away to pattern it a ram in the first place. But Jacob's powers of deception and manipulating the situation, they weren't enough to do anything really. It was God at work in this situation. God had something in mind that these two men could not shake. The wonderful truth about God is there, isn't it, in, in um, Jacob's word. The truth is God's presence, God's presence with his people, God's presence in his plans 
if the God of my father had not been on my side, not been with me, then these things would have turned out very differently. The presence of God. God's work of grace unfolds with the presence of God. It's not a, a mindless machine. God's work, God's plans, God's uh, grace are not abstract principles that operate in the world. They work with the presence of God. And God was present with Jacob even through these 20 years that he now calls as years of difficulty and hardship and cold and heat and bearing the cost himself. It was God's presence that was at work in those years. God was present even when God was not perceived to be present at the time. Some of those cold nights, what was Jacob thinking? Those hot days, what was Jacob thinking? Did he look around to see evidence of God and wonder? Maybe even silently question? Who knows? He probably, though, didn't see the evidence of God's presence, but now looking back, he says, yes, actually, God was there for me. Genesis has enough to say on Jacob's riches that they are the gift of God. It certainly makes that very clear. But greater than goods and things is Jacob's growth, his maturity over these years. When he left home, when he had to run away, he was a man of the tents, a man of the soft life and easy living. Here, 20 years later, he's had 20 years in the paddocks and that's changed him into a man who was solid and hardworking and well grown up, pulling his own weight now. And particular, in uh, much more important than just working in a paddock, in particular, Jacob knows now that his life depends 100% on the presence of God, on the favour of God. Have you ever come to that conclusion? Have you got that as a solid commitment in yourself? I've had friends sometimes say to me that God feels absent. And as they've explained their situations, I could see why they would make that observation, why they could feel that way. Other people have said um, to me things about, that are going on bad in their life, and they've asked questions about how God could be around when things bad happen. Fair comments again to, to ask, how, how on earth is God here in this time of sickness or trouble or whatever it happens to be? But for my reading of the Bible and my time as a Christian, the most awful idea for me is that God would be absent. If there's something awful happening to me, to others, to people we love, it would be infinitely worse if God had gone missing as well. That not only was there the, the illness or the, the unfortunate situation, but that there would also be a heaven of iron and God hidden behind it. Even in troubled times, comfort is knowing that God is still present in that time. The mystery remains how God is present and why God is present through dark nights. But the encouragement is that he is present. I think we can all thank God for his presence. Just wrapping up for Genesis 31 now. In another talk, a week or two weeks ago, I can't remember now, I spoke about the echoes that the Bible gives us, where Bible events share similarities. Common themes emerge, common actions seem to take place. That They're not carbon copies at all, but echoes of activities. Again, today there are echoes. But echoes are fantastic, actually, because they show us that God is consistent and that God is persistent. God doesn't change, and God sticks with his plan. What he promised back then is no different from what he promises now, that we trust his word and trust his plans to unfold. And the echo today is, well, important, because what God did in Jacob is what God is like today, what God is like always. Now, if you've been a Bible reader for a while, did you see today's major echo? We have in this passage Jacob, who later gets called Israel, by the way. 
he gets his name changed. We have Jacob, Israel, fleeing the place where he was in service, in kind of forced servitude. Jacob has lots of possessions as he flees, gifted to him. Now the man who used to command Jacob chases him furiously with threats. But the Lord God scared that man away. So Jacob, Jacob's family, and all his possessions were safe. That's the story, that's the events of the story. And the Exodus, in the next book of the Bible, is a great echo of what happened in Jacob's life. Or perhaps Jacob is an early echo of what's going to happen in the book of Exodus. They're both true, <laughs> they echo each other. Centuries after Jacob, Israel the nation would flee their slavery to the Egyptian people. As they flee, they, they hold in their hands the gifts of the terrified Egyptians who want them to go because God is so powerful. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was initially glad to see them go. No longer will they terrify our people. But Pharaoh changed his mind. Pharaoh chased. Pharaoh cornered the people of Israel. But at that moment of highest drama and pressure, God defeated Pharaoh. And so God's people and their possessions and their generation were safe. You see the echo there is echoing down the generations, even just in the first two books of the Bible. And God is the same today who saves us through Jesus. God is the same today whose faithfulness and presence with his people encourages us still. And so the confidence that God protects his people, I think it's required faith for every Christian. Necessary faith for when things are tough and necessary lessons to learn when things are going well that we're ready for any day. The confidence that God protects his people means that we can share with the words of Psalm 46. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Hope you too can say those words. And I hope you too can join with me as I, I pray based on those words today. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you are the Lord of hosts. Thank you that you are with us through faith in Christ. And we thank you that you, the God of Jacob, are our fortress. Please help us to be strong in your strength today. Amen. <music>